Hi, I'm Dr. Uh, Corey Warmink. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine uh, doctor. Today I'm going to talk to you guys about toxicology. Toxicology basically uh, is defined as the adverse effects of a chemical on a biological tissue. We're obviously going to talk about living organisms, humans, um, today. Um, you know, every drug has a potential to be toxic, right? Paracelsus in the 1500s uh, said every substance uh, has the ability to be a poison. It really is just dose that determines if it's going to be a poison or a remedy. And uh, I agree with him. He's a smart guy. Anyway, um, today specifically what we're going to talk about are non-drug chemicals and illicit or designer drugs. Um, you should have covered kind of the toxic effect of uh, actual prescribed drugs as they've come up during your lectures. Um, so first off, let's define toxicity. Um, basically, it's a, a chemical's capacity to cause injury. And so um, obviously the more toxic something is, the more damage it can do. Where do the majority of drugs cause co toxicity in the body? Um, the main two uh, kind of ways to receive toxic effects is through inhalation, obviously that would affect your lungs, or ingestion, uh, and usually the site that's going to be affected there is your liver. The other sites that uh, are most vulnerable are organs with high blood flow, your kidneys, your brain. So we'll kind of see throughout the course of going through these drugs how they affect those different uh, tissues and how uh, the different uh, ways of ingesting them or inhaling them kind of affect uh, what kind of toxic effects you're going to get. All right, let's jump right into some of the, the agents. We're going to start with more kind of chemicals that you would find more environmentally or you know occupationally. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is carbon tetrachloride. So um, the first little group we're going to talk about is halogenated hydrocarbon. The symbol for this is C, CL, Cl4, so carbon tetrachloride. It makes sense. Anyway, the main use of carbon tetrachloride is in like the cleaning industry, um, like dry cleaners, uh, they call it carbon tet. Also, it is freon, so I'm sure you've heard the term freon. It's being phased out now, but uh, in refrigerants. Um, also, it's what's found in lava lamps. Um, uh, just now you know. Anyway, it's a colorless liquid, has a little bit of a sweet smell to it. Um, the most common ways you're going to get carbon tetrachloride in a human is through contaminated drinking water or from an occupational inhalation. Um, the effects, uh, if you inhale it, are it's, it's a real irritant to the eyes and respiratory symptom, uh, system. Um, it definitely can affect the liver and, and kidneys if it's ingested. So you'll get nausea, vomiting, um, eventually leading to uh, stupor, coma, death. Pretty much every one of these is going to eventually lead to like seizures, coma, death. You know, when in doubt, death is the final option. Anyway, so carbon tetrachloride, not horrible. It's not something you see a lot because it's getting phased out. But uh, don't get stoned and drink your lava lamp. All right, moving on. Chloroform, another halogenated hydrocarbon. Um, so it's CHCl3, so basically a, a cousin to carbon tetrachloride. Um, it's a real dense liquid. It actually has a very sweet smell also. Um, it's a refrigerant also, but being phased out. An old school anesthetic, back in the day they used chloroform. Um, it is uh, volatile, so it can explode. That wasn't great. And it had a lot of um, cardiac effects that we'll talk about. It also now mainly is being used as a precursor in the production of Teflon. Um, so uh, the stuff, uh, when in inhaled, obviously isn't instantly fatal because we use it as an anesthetic, but it can cause arrhythmias pretty easily and you can die very suddenly uh, from inhalation uh, from an, uh, an arrhythmia. Ingesting it, however, is uh, not a good idea. As little as 10 mLs can be fatal to you. And so, uh, again, uh, it affects the liver and kidneys. You get nausea, vomiting, uh, they'll get real dizzy, bad headache, stupor, seizures, coma, death <clears throat> down there. All right. Let's move on to the uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, specifically benzene. Uh, benzene's chemical structure is C6H6. It's got a cool little ring structure, a hexagon with little prongs poking out. It's uh, used predominantly as a solvent. Uh, it, it's, been, uh, it's found in crude oil. It's also uh, put in gas to stop knocking. Um, they've limited how much you can put in gas. Now it's only 1% of gas just because of um, the toxic effects. 
Um, the number one source now of people getting benzene is from tobacco smoke, um, predominantly inhalation, not so much secondhand smoke. Um, you can get it just from you know burning of fossil fuels and exa uh, um, exhaust. Um, the uh, um, thing you need to know about benzene, this is, if they're going to ask you something on a test, this will be it, is it affects your bone marrow and can cause leukemia, specifically AML, acute myelogenous leukemia. Um, you know, it, it also can cause CNS depression and things, but the number one thing it, if, with repeat exposure especially is leukemia, so try to remember that. Um, all right, let's move on to toluene. Um, kind of a cousin to benzene, it's C6H5CH3, so basically it's just been methylated um, benzene. Um, it's a solvent, it's in paint thinner, furniture polish. The number one exposure of this is usually in auto ed emissions. Um, you can huff it uh, and get a little bit of a high off of it. I don't recommend trying it because it uh, too can kill you. Um, it causes a lot of CNS depression, you get drowsy, ataxic, um, it'll impair your speech um, and eventually cause brain damage. If you repeatedly take this in, uh, your, uh, your medical career is probably not going to work out so great. Um, also, like all these, can cause some liver and kidney damage. So next let's talk about some alcohols. We'll start with methanol. Methanol is also known as uh, wood alcohol. It's uh, kind of classically, you know, what you think of in uh, like moonshine that can make you go blind, although that's kind of overstated, but it's a, a volatile, colorless, uh, flammable liquid. Um, it's made from distilling wood, wood alcohol. Um, you can use it as a, like a flex fuel in the car. They're getting away from methanol, going now to ethanol, um, but it actually is uh, used per, in like racing series, monster trucks, stuff like that. There you go. So, you know, the big thing with that is uh, it can cause blindness. As little as drinking 10 mLs can uh, affect your optic nerve and make you go blind. If you drink like three, four ounces of the stuff, it'll kill you. So, um, it, uh, it, it's metabolized to formic acid, which is uh, the one, the substance that causes the blindness. It's an acid, so it causes acidosis and predominantly it'll just cause respiratory failure, you just stop breathing. So, um, you know, initially you'll have some headache, some dizziness, nausea, and then confusion, and then what do we always end with? Death. Ethylene glycol is the next alcohol I'd like to talk about. Uh, it's the main component in antifreeze. Um, it's odorless, colorless, but has a very syrupy, sweet uh, taste. Um, if you were trying to produce something that was uh, dangerous for children or animals uh, to ingest, you'd make antifreeze. It's a beautiful greenish yellow color, it tastes really sweet, and so you got to be really careful. Uh, it uh, basically is metabolized to glycolic acid and then oxalic acid, and that's uh, the one that crystallizes in your kidneys, causes your kidneys to shut down. It also goes to your, your brain and your heart, but mainly it's going to give you an acidosis. Um, the uh, um, way to treat it uh, classically has been actually infuse ethanol or give someone a slug of whiskey. Now we have something called fomepazole or 4-MP which is a competitive inhibitor of the alcohol dehydrogenase and so basically it uh, keeps it from being metabolized down to oxalic acid, lets it get excreted out uh, to the kidneys. So I guarantee you there will be something about ethylene glycol that's a very popular thing for toxicologists to talk about remember from fomepazole or 4-MP um, and just remember that it causes an acidosis. Um, as an aside, a little automotive pro tip, you can't take antifreeze and just put 100% antifreeze in your car and have it work better. It's got to be the perfect ratio is 70% antifreeze to 30% water because it basically binds with water and keeps it from freezing. So at that level, it's like minus 60 that it'll freeze at. 100% antifreeze freezes at minus 10 for all my northern brothers out there. Anyway, all right, let's move on to another alcohol, isopropanol. Basically, that's found in, if you take an alcohol swab in the hospital, that's about 70% uh, isopropyl al alcohol or isopropanol. Um, it's also used in cleaners. Um, it really does have a little bit limited toxicity, uh, secondary to the fact that it's metabolized to acetone, and it doesn't really get that much farther. And so uh, the effects of acetone are, are not that severe. Next, we're going to talk about some pesticides. Um, pesticides are used 
everywhere, really. It's amazing how uh, kind of how many uh, pesticides are used. The most common ones are the organophosphates and the carbamates. Um, organophosphates are like your malathion, diazinon, you may have heard of. The carbamates are uh, seven is the classic one. Seven dust you kind of sprinkle. It's also a band. has a really cool lead singer. But anyway, um, but these are very common. Um, and uh, it's not uh, unusual to see, uh, especially kids or farm workers, exposed to these things. Um, the way they work is they inhibit acetylcholinesterase. So basically you get increased acetylcholine. Um, they work by different method, methods, but they kind of have the same effect. The dangerous thing about them is eventually they will irreversibly bind, uh, and so you, you really can't um, knock them off. Um, just a, a sense of how dangerous they can be. If you ever heard of sarin nerve gas, it's very fatal. It basically works by the same mechanism, and they're, they're cousins. Um, so the number one thing you need to learn about organophosphates Usually they'll ask you with organophosphates is what do you, symptoms do you get? And uh, the mnemonic is dumbbells. So it's uh, diarrhea, urination, meiosis. Um, so that's small pupils. Just as an aside, the way I always remember, so there's meiosis and mydriasis. To me, meiosis is a smaller word than mydriasis. So meiosis, small pupils. Because on talk stuff, that's everywhere. Um, so that's my way of remembering it. All right, back to the dumb. Um, so bradycardia, bronchospasm, emesis, lacrimation, sweating, salivation. So basically just think that like there's fluids coming out of every orifice of your body. I mean, it's just like running out. Um, you're pooping, peeing, throwing up, sweating, crying. Basically think of what would happen if I went to a Justin Bieber concert. Similar effect. Anyway, um, the, uh, the way to fight it, uh, or to treat it is with atropine. Basically, it, that fights the symptoms. It, um, and then if you catch it early enough, there's something called pralidoxime or 2-PAM. And basically, it binds the acetylcholine esterase, and uh, it competes with the toxin, basically. But you you got to get that in usually the first six hours or so, because like I said, otherwise it'll irreversibly bind um, the acetylcholine esterase. The next... Uh, uh, kind of thing I want to talk about is pesticides. Um, let's start with the pyrethroids. The classical example of that is RAID. Um, so it's a, an ex insecticide that causes paralysis by opening up sodium channels uh, in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So basically you, you paralyze the poor little roaches. Anyway, um, so you can imagine what it does to us. You lose coordination, you get tremors, itching, eventually seizures, and then respiratory fa failure. Um, it really, the pyrethroids have a low uh, human toxicity. Basically, we can excrete it out for whatever reason, insects can't, so it just builds up and builds up in their system. So, um, but that's how it works. Um, the next one I'd like to talk about is rotenone. Um, it's a, a crop insecticide, you know, sprayed on large crops. It also has been used in the past as a, a fish killer. Um, it, uh, the reason it's used there is because it, it's absorbed really well in, in gills. For humans, it's not absorbed very well in the gut. So even if you kill a fish with it, you can eat it because it doesn't get absorbed very well. Um, so basically what it does, it, it prevents the production of ATP from NADH. So you basically get no cellular energy in your mitochondria and you eventually die. So we'll start out with nausea, vomiting, head to seizures, and then death. But you really do need, in humans, a pretty high exposure of this to cause uh, serious symptoms. All right, next on the hit parade, rat poison, uh, which predominantly are uh, warfarin-based. Uh, um, actually, it wasn't really discovered until the 20s when they realized a bunch of cows were uh, dying after any procedure, bleeding out after eating some spoiled sweet clover. So it's produced in plants, but only when they're, they're spoiled. So. Um, you know, it's something that we use to actually treat people, but in rodents, uh, it'll kill them. So it's an anticoagulant. It's uh, the vitamin K dependent uh, factors in the clotting cascade, two, uh, seven, nine, and 10. That's something that you'll be asked, two, seven, nine, and 10. Remember that. Those are the vitamin K dependent clotting factors, not just in toxicology. That's something that they love to ask. Um, you know, the, the rodenticides, 
there's a first generation that are kind of more warfarin based and there's the super coumadins they call them. Um, they're a little more dangerous but they're really only going to cause severe toxicity unless someone is doing it on purpose or uh, you know you're ingesting it large amounts. Like it's not just like oh I ate one bite of rat poison. Anyway kind of the kicker clinically is when we get kids all the time that eat rat poison it's, it's really serious but uh, the Warfarins take a long time to work. I mean, it can take two to five days uh, to see effects. So, you know, they come in two hours later and you're like, well, if two days from now you start bruising, come back. Um, you know, you can treat it if it's severe with vitamin K. Obviously, they're vitamin K dependent um, home factors. The other thing you can use is fresh frozen plasma. Basically, it has all the clotting factors in it, so you're just replacing it. Um, the, uh, um, the reason they are so good as killing rodents is because it takes so long to work. A, a rat will eat something, wait, make sure he doesn't get sick, eat some more, and so the fact that it kind of is delayed um, is a, a good thing from a, a rat killing point of view. All right, let's move on to the heavy metals. Um, heavy metals is really a vague term. It, it has nothing to do with their weight. I mean, it's coincidentally it does, but basically means metals that can cause some toxicity. Um, you can look that up and argue with me about what heavy metals really means. But um, the first one we're going to talk to uh, you about today is lead. Um, so lead is an element. Uh, you remember that? Uh, PB from plumbus in Latin. So uh, you probably think you know this, but I'll just remind you. That's why we call them plumbers because everything pretty much pipe-wise is made of lead. Plumber, plumbers. Anyway. All right, moving on. Um, you find lead in uh, old paint, classically. Um, there used to be lead-based paints. They used to actually add lead to gas, or it's unleaded and leaded. Now, you know, that's pretty much getting phased out. Um, obviously, uh, in old pipes, they used to have lead. That's getting phased out. It definitely is an industrial pollutant also, um, just from smelting uh, and things. Uh, one thing to know about lead is it's, it's worse than kids when they ingest it. Uh, kids uh, absorb it much more efficiently. If you give a dose to a kid, they're going to absorb about 40 percent, while an adult will only absorb about 10 percent. Um, it has a very long half-life. So in your blood, it has a half-life of one to two months. Pretty much all lead eventually goes to your bones, um, and there it has a half-life of 20 to 30 years. Um, you can actually see on x-rays of people that have ingested a lot of lead, what we call lead lines, and they're just um, hyperpigmented lines on, on x-rays of, of lead deposits. Um, the uh, effects of lead, it really can affect everything in your body, but we'll kind of talk about the most common effects uh, that you see. Uh, initially, usually you'll see GI effects, um, constipation, I know it sounds kind of proximal, but uh, diarrhea also. If you get later on, they can just get intense muscle spasms and abdominal pain with it. Um, you know, the, the central nervous system effects are real common, headache, confusion, they, they're real fatigued and clumsy and when kids come in, you know, it's just kind of this vague complaints of he's just not acting right and sleeping all the time and it can be uh, lead. Obviously, you get enough of it, you can get stupor, seizure, coma, and our favorite, death. Um, so in children, even really low lead levels, uh, just like that wouldn't even be considered toxic per se, uh, decrease IQ. And so um, it, it is something that you want to really try to decrease the environment and, um, you know, decrease in the system. Um, the other real famous effect of lead is uh, um, anemia. It causes a hypochromic um, microcytic anemia, so pale cells that are really small. Um, the, if you ever hear uh, basophilic stippling on a red blood uh, cell, that's lead poisoning until proven otherwise. Um, it basically blocks production of, of heme uh, in the cell, and so you just get uh, you don't get as much uh, cells. The one of the f factors that basically blocks in the heme synthesis causes an increase in something called protoporphyrin. So that's kind of the test you run to check if someone has. Um, the anemia is from lead versus like iron deficiency. Um, the actual test that you can run is to check lead levels themselves. They take a little while to come back, um, but you ja actually check the lead level in the blood. All right, so let's talk treatment. Basically, what you're trying to do is bind that lead uh, and get it out of the system. And so there's something called dimercaprol or BAL. 
Um, it's an IV drug. There's another one, calcium EDTA, another IV drug, and then uh, something called succimer, which everyone I know calls DMSA, which is a PO drug, and then penicillamine. All those kind of work by different effects. You know, they, they ask you about all of them uh, probably on your test, so you, you basically just got to memorize them. So dimercaparol, succimer, calcium EDTA, penicillamine, all are different lead binders. One thing to know too, if they got really tricky, is uh, some of these actually increase your lead levels just for a little bit because it's leaching it out of all of your systems. And so you got to be a little bit careful if someone has crazy high lead levels that you don't give them these and actually make them worse, worse initially. All right, so let's move on to mercury. Mercury, symbol is HG. Um, it's the only metal that's liquid at normal atmospheric uh, conditions. Um, class, you probably heard of the whole uh, mad as a hatter um, from using mercury. Uh, hat makers used mercury back in the day. Um, it's in Alice in Wonderland. People usually overestimate the effects of that, but it's one way to remember it. So there's three different um, ways you can get exposed to mercury. There's elemental mercury, so just the element itself. That's an occupational hazard, the inhalation of, of vapor um, that we talked about. Not very many people work with mercury, but it, it definitely is toxic when inhaled. Um, you get uh, tremors, memory loss, decreased verbal skills, um, eventually affects your kidney, uh, um, and, and can be uh, fairly severe. Um, the inorganic salt of mercury is another occupational thing. It's more of a corrosive, uh, basically will burn any tissue that it touches, uh, especially your mouth, um, but also can cause uh, kidney damage. Um, the one that is most likely to happen in this everyday people is or organic mercury, predominantly found in fish, higher up the food chain, um, more likely. Um, there's a guy named Jeremy Piven who basically claims he ate sushi twice a day for 20 years and had horrible mercury poisoning, but some people say they're trying to get out of a job on Broadway, but I don't know. Anyway, what that can do to you though is cause a tingling, numbness, visual changes, ataxia, hearing loss, and then our favorite tremors and eventually paralysis. So I love sushi. I don't, I think you got to eat quite a bit to be in trouble. All right, the next uh, heavy metal I'd like to talk about is cadmium. Its chemical symbol is CD. It's uh, predominantly used as a pigment. It also was used as an anti-corrosive on steel and in batteries. I don't know if, you, if anyone does art, cadmium yellow, cadmium orange, you know, cadmium red. Um, it makes good pigments. Um, for us today, the number one exposure, again, is cigarette smoke. Um, by far, you can get some occupational um, uh, exposure. Um, inhalation is much worse than ingestion. Um, you can get something called metal fume fever from it um, that eventually can lead to death. Um, cadmium is, uh, once it's in you, it's in you for a long time. The half-life of it is uh, 10 to 30 years and so it causes mainly effects in the lungs, um, also in the kidneys. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. What is the antidote for mercury poisoning? Dimercaprol. And what is the antidote for carbon monoxide poisoning? It's 100% oxygen. What's the antidote for organophosphate poisoning? Pralidoxime. And it's obvious to me that there is no antidote for your particular brand of stupidity. No amount of screaming, shouting, insults, abuse, or infantile tantrums on my part seems to have any effect at all on overcoming your utter incompetence. This is it. I'm done. Goodbye and good luck. You're gonna need it. Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis. It's time for your quick review number one. Let's get started. What are the common sources of mercury exposure? 
Well, we find this a lot in fish. Uh, more specifically, we find it in shark, we find it in swordfish. Uh, occasionally, you'll still run into an old thermometer. So old thermometers, you hear of uh, maybe your parents or grandparents used to talk about how they would break a thermometer and they would play with the, with the mercury and it was so much fun. Um, so you can still find some mercury in, in old thermometers. And then batteries. Uh, there are some batteries that can leak and, and uh, provide a significant dose of mercury as well. Next, which halogenated hydrocarbon is associated with acute myelogenous leukemia? Well, you need to remember benzene. So benzene goes along with uh, AML. What signs and symptoms are related to mercury toxicity? Well, you can get tingling, so you get sort of a tingling sensation in your body. And then you get acrodynia. And what's that? Well, that's peeling of the fingertips. So you get a lot of skin peeling. It's kind of gross looking. Uh, and then abdominal pain. And that's a, a nonspecific but pretty common symptom with uh, mercury toxicity. Next, which is, uh, what is the primary source of lead exposure for children? Um, we probably see lead toxicity a lot more often in children, uh, but it has gone down over the years. Um, but we find this uh, mostly in kids who uh, either come into contact or eat uh, lead paint or chipping paint. Um, and this is uh, specifically in houses that were constructed prior to 1978. So when you're questioning uh, parents uh, about uh, potential exposure to lead, you need to ask, well, when was your house uh, constructed? And they go, well, it's a really, really old house. Um, you know, sometimes even though they've repainted or refurbished a house, still there can be uh, uh, layers of lead paint underneath uh, the new paint. So if you have something that's chipping, you could, could still potentially get um, uh, lead exposure uh, from those paint chips. Next, a 32-year-old farmer presents with diaphoresis, watery eyes, drooling, and vomiting. Um, what is the, uh, uh, what was he exposed to and how uh, do you manage this problem? Well, this is a typical organophosphate uh, exposure and this will uh, be a question somewhere in your career. You're going to get the whole uh, drooling <laughs> question. Anytime you hear drooling and, and watery eyes, always think of organ uh, organophosphate. So how are we going to treat this problem? Well, first, supportive. Uh, ABCs. You need to think of your airway, think of your breathing, uh, think of your circulation. So uh, occasionally these people will need intubation. Here's an important thing you need to remember about intubation. Um, you don't want to use succinyl choline uh, for rapid sequence intubations because you know succinyl choline is uh, metabolized by acetylcholinesterases. So um, the organophosphate is inhibiting that uh, acetylcholinesterase. Uh, and therefore, you'll get a prolonged neuromuscular uh, uh, blockade with your succinylcholine. So don't use succinylcholine when, when you think someone has organophosphate because they will be um, blocked for, for a lot longer than probably you want them to be. So what else are we going to use? Well, we're going to use uh, something that's going uh, to, to counteract the, the actions of that organophosphate. Remember, the organophosphates are basically allowing too much um, acetylcholine to, to float around and it's causing uh, the uh, uh, increased cholinergic activity. So we want to use uh, uh, atropine. So atropine competes with acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptors, and it prevents that cholinergic activity. So instead of getting the, uh, the watery eyes, you're going to dry those eyes up. Instead of drooling, you're going to get dry mouth um, if you're going too far in the other direction. So what else can you do? Well, there's another one called uh, pralidoxine. So Atropine does not bind to the nicotinic receptor. So sometimes atropine, when you have a severe organophosphate uh, poisoning, will be ineffective in treating some of the neuromuscular dysfunction. So um, you still have a lot of uh, activation of that nicotinic receptor. So the pralidoxine uh, can help in that regards because it uh, is a cholinesterase reactivating agent. So um, it'll start pulling out some of that acetylcholine and start affecting that nicotinic uh, uh, activation as well. Name the primary source of exposure for the following hydrocarbons. So how are you going to get uh, into contact with carbon uh, tetrachloride? Well, mainly in contaminated drinking water. Chloroform, uh, basically you're going to find this in the manufacturing uh, of chemicals. So someone who's working in a, in a chemical manufacturing plant might be exposed to more chloroform. Benzene, uh, the primary exposure is in tobacco smoke. And then toluene is uh, primarily an exposure from automobiles. What are the uh, symptoms of ethylene glycol uh, poisoning? Remember, this is what's in uh, antifreeze, and it's really sweet, um, and kids like to get into it because it's, it's got a pretty color and, and it tastes good, so that's just candy in a bottle. Um, so 
you're going to get some non-specific stuff. You're going to get vomiting uh, to begin with. So someone who's coming vomiting, that isn't necessarily going to tip you off to ethylene glycol po poisoning. Um, but they're then going to show, if you check labs, some metabolic acidosis. Um, and then they may also have maybe some cardiovascular dysfunction. And then finally, uh, if you have a, a significant poisoning, you can get acute renal failure. All right, next. A three-year-old male patient presents with decreased appetite and slightly decreased activity. After a thorough review of his chart, it is noticed that he has uh, been delayed on several of his uh, developmental milestones. Uh, what is the probable cause of this uh, problem? Well, this is a, sort of a typical question trying to get at lead poisoning. So um, not everyone with lead poisoning is going to come in with really dramatic symptoms. Uh, they're not going to come in with uh, altered uh, uh, mental status and, uh, and, and having major, major, major changes in activity. It can just be that, gosh, they're a little delayed on their, on their milestones. Maybe they're not eating as much. Uh, these are really non-specific symptoms, uh, and kids will grow and go through their milestones at, at different speeds. So um, that's why we like to screen for lead. Um, and even uh, uh, levels, and you'll have to memorize these numbers later on, but 10 is sort of your cutoff. Anything over 10 uh, has been shown to, to cause some developmental problems and some cognitive problems. Um, it's not until you get well above 50 and 60 that we have to start uh, doing uh, chelation therapy. Uh, but even at relatively low dosages, I mean, any lead is bad, but uh, even relatively uh, elevated levels like above 10 can still show some long-term problems. So that's why we screen for lead because these can be very nonspecific and you don't want to catch it because you don't want to alter someone's IQ uh, uh, through very easily um, um, preventable problems. All right, next. Other than chelation therapy, what, what else is important in the treatment of lead poisoning? So we talked about uh, lead poisoning in the last question. So what are we going to do? Well, say we're not in the super high levels, because most of the time you're not going to see a kid with a lead level of 100. You're just not going to see it. Most of the time you'll see a lead level of 15 or something like that. Um, so the number one thing is prevention. So um, in most states, there's a, a state health department authority that's um, in charge of inspecting homes uh, for lead exposure. So if you get a patient that you're screening and their lead level's elevated, um, you're going to have to contact that, uh, that authority, and then they're going to go out to the house, and they're going to look around. They're going to test for, for any potential lead exposure, look at the paint, see if there's things chipping um, to help find uh, where this lead is coming from. So it's very, very helpful. It's not real invasive. It's not like they're coming in accusing you of feeding your kid lead. Um, but it is very important to find out where is this coming from because most of the time it's ignorance that's the problem. It's not so much um, negligence. It's just that, like, gosh, I didn't know that that over there was, was you know, a, a significant source of lead. Now the other thing, and this is maybe something you wouldn't think of, but nutrition is very, very important in helping pr uh, prevent lead uh, exposure. So regular meals and adequate calcium and iron can help minimize lead absorption. Uh, and then another thing that's important is, is decreasing pica. So pica uh, is often associated uh, with iron deficiency anemia. And pica is where you get this uh, desire to eat um, uh, inorganic things. So you're eating like soil, uh, and lead chips and things that aren't really uh, supposed to be eaten. So if you have iron deficiency anemia, you have a greater chance of having pica. Um, so if someone isn't iron deficient anemia, uh, anemic and having uh, regular meals, then they're less likely to eat a paint chip. So, um, and this is obviously much more common in, in little kids who don't know any better. Um, but nutrition is important in helping to prevent our, our uh, lead exposure. All right, that's gonna conclude our quick review number one. Let's get back to your main lecturer. All right, let's move on to some of the gases and inhaled particles. Uh, number one, uh, by far, is kind of classically getting asked about in toxicology is carbon monoxide, so just CO. Um, it's a colorless, odorless gas. Um, it's a production of combustion, right? So if you burn something, you're gonna get carbon monoxide. Um, you know, the classic story uh, is, you know, somebody had a fire, fell asleep, gone. I've treated people that even had like a grill on a, a patio that was covered and uh, got into their house and came in. They did, they did fine because I'm an awesome doctor, but um, you know, you got to be careful anytime you're burning something. The effect carbon monoxide has in the body is to bind to hemoglobin. It does that very strongly, 270 times more strongly than oxygen does. And so when it does, it creates what's called carboxyhemoglobin. Um, it, it binds to hemoglobin, holds on very strong, and also forces oxygen to hold on to hemoglobin longer. So you really get a depletion 
uh, in your cells of oxygen. Um, it reduces oxygen delivery throughout the body, and so you get hypoxia, or decreased oxygen. Um, the brain and the heart are by far the most sensitive things to uh, hypoxia. You get confusion, headache, obviously with your lungs you're going to be working harder to breathe, um, eventually seizure, coma, death. Um, late in the process with carbon monoxide you'll get cherry red lips and nail beds they call it. Um, they like to ask that on tests. I will say I've seen a lot of carbon monoxide poison. If you have cherry red lips and nail beds just call the mortuary because it's bad news man. You're, you're late in the game. Um, with uh, the treatment of it, basically you want to increase oxygen delivery, right? So 100% O2, um, you know, if you have a hyperbaric chamber sitting nearby, you can do that also. That's usually in rare cases um, that are really severe. But basically you want to try to knock off that carbon uh, monoxide off the hemoglobin molecules. All right, let's move on to cyanide. Um, Cyanide isn't just a, a thing, that's a, a group, a CN negative. So you have like hydrogen cyanide, sodium cyanide, potassium cyanide. Um, they're actually produced by uh, bacteria and fungi. You find cyanides in uh, fruit pits like peaches and mangoes um, and, uh, and bitter almonds. So the, the smell of cyanide will be described as bitter almond. They like to ask that a lot. Um, I don't know if you've ever smelled bitter almonds, but if you do, don't eat them. Um, so uh, the, the cyanide group binds to various what they call metalloenzymes. Um, it's caused by inactivating the cytochrome oxidase in your system um, and basically uh, you get no cellular uh, respiration so you, your, your cells can't uh, work. Um, you know they use it now in the mining of gold and silver it kind of takes off the other uh, things that binds to the other metallic things except gold and silver. Um, we actually use uh, a cyanide sodium nitroprusside as a, a hypertension med, so it actually has some medicinal use. Um, the symptoms of uh, cyanide, uh, you go pretty quick to death on this one, but you uh, first will get weak, giddy, they'll have headache, they'll be real confused, have difficulty breathing, uh, and then eventually go into coma, apnea, uh, seizures, and our favorite death. Um, you definitely, uh, there's certain people that can have those symptoms, that real difficulty work of breathing, and then they kind of get better for a little bit, and then kind of go back and almost cycles on 12 minute cycles for whatever reason. So, anyway, um, the way you treat it is uh, somewhat complex. They have what's called cyanide kits. In the traditional kits, they'll have nitrites. So, uh, sodium nitrite is an IV drug that they'll push, and then amyl uh, nitrite is an inhaled drug. Um, basically, uh, it's, it's somewhat complex what it does. They make methemoglobin, which binds the cyanide. Um, that, that creates something called cyanomethemoglobin. Then you get a drug called uh, sodium thiol sulfate. It binds everything up and gets it excreted out in the urine. So it's kind of a, it's two steps, but one's uh, the nitrates first, and then you give sodium thiol sulfate to bind out the product of what's created by the nitrites and the cyanide. There's a new um, treatment that works way better, but it's a little more expensive called hydroxycobalamin. It's a, a cousin of uh, B12, or really a form of B12 that binds uh, cyanide groups directly and you can excrete it out. Um, they use it a lot in Europe um, and it's, it'll be prominent here soon. All right, so let's talk about silica or silicon dioxide, so SiO2. Um, it's found in sand or quartz. Um, also, they has a whole valley named after it in California. But uh, it's the most abundant mineral in the Earth's crust, so it's, it's found everywhere. Um, we use it to make glass, optical fibers, obviously computer stuff, um, porcelain and cement. Um, that really, uh, the main thing you know is if inhaled, it can cause, cause silicosis, which is a really progressive lung disease. It's brutal because uh, it just gets worse. There's not a whole lot you can do for it. It has a very poor prognosis. You get lung fibrosis, they'll get emphysema, and of course, eventually death. But uh, silicosis is, a, is nasty. Wear a mask if you're around uh, um, anybody that's like doing wood, I mean not wood, stone carving.
anyway, let's move on. Asbestos. Um, the word asbestos is Greek for unquenchable. It's a pretty cool name, I think. Um, asbestos itself is actually a group of six different silicate minerals. So uh, they're kind of like uh, silica, but the reason that they became so prominent is because they have very long fibers. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen asbestos, but it's just these long strands. Um, it, uh, is uh, very good at absorbing sound and is incredibly heat tolerant. Um, back in the, the day, we'll say, uh, people wrote stories about how people in Persia would have garments made of asbestos and to clean them, they just throw them in a fire, um, just to impress their friends, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, the fact that it's so resistant to heat, that it was used in like ceiling tiles, um, walls, things like that, just because it uh, was a great uh, fire retardant. Um, the main kind of problems you can get with asbestos are um, chronic inhalation can cause asbestosis, which is another chronic fibrosis of the um, lungs um, that uh, just causes kind of progressive damage. You can get lung cancer increases associated with it, but if you watch TV late at night, you've probably heard of mesothelioma um, law firms out there. If you've been exposed to asbestos, you can get this cancer. It's in the, the lining of the lung. Um, it's, uh, it's and in the chest wall. It's, it's rare and it's pretty much only found with asbestos. And if you're diagnosed with it, usually within two years, you're, you're dead. It's a pretty much uh, fatal. One just aside about asbestos, the, the longest running and the most expensive tort or, you know, like case uh, of damages in our country is asbestos. It's caused a lot of lawsuits because it was so prominent and it takes uh, some time to get rid of. All right. The other thing with the, uh, that would create it to be long running is if you were exposed to asbestos, you may not get symptoms for 30 plus years. So it can just kind of sit there and then boom, you get mesothelioma when you're an old man. All right. Next, I want to run through some uh, antidotes with you guys. Uh, these are often on tests, they'll throw them as matching. It's easy as a test uh, maker to put these on there. So uh, there's no easy way to memorize them. You just kind of got to do it. So um, I'll start with the drug and then we'll throw down the uh, antidote. So let's start with uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol. Uh, the antidote for that is N-acetylcysteine. We call it NAC often. Some people older will call it mucomist. That's actually a, a neb treatment that breaks up mucus. Um, basically, it, it binds the toxic metabolites of, uh, um, that are produced from uh, Tylenol ingestion, protects your liver. So, uh, and Tylenol overdoses, basically, you end up dying of liver failure. It's horrible. If you want to kill yourself, don't use Tylenol at all. It's not a good option. Um, the one thing to know about NAC or N-acetylcysteine, it smells horrible. Like, it, it will clear a room. It smells so bad. All right, next let's talk about the salicylates or aspirin. Um, the antidote for that is sodium bicarb. Basically it alkalinizes the urine and increases excretion. If you're having severe effects and it's uh, looking grim, uh, they actually go to dialysis to um, remove the uh, salicylates. Um, next let's talk about amphetamines. Um, the antidote for that is uh, ammonium chloride, NH4Cl. Um, basically, it acidifies the urine, so the exact opposite of sodium bicarb, um, and it, you know, will acidify your serum too. I've never really seen this done. It's rare, but I guess they want you to know it. Um, let's talk about organophosphates again. Y'all know this. What's the uh, um, thing that you get? Dumbbells, right? How do you treat it? Atropine, and if you catch it early, pralidoxine. That also goes for the carbamates too. Um, all right, anticholinergics. So uh, those are like atropine and ipratropium, which is atrament, it's an inhaled uh, drug. The antidote for that is Um Moving on to the beta blockers. The antidote for that is glucagon. Basically, beta blockers are going to make your heart rate go to nothing, decrease your cardiac output. Glucagon will bump that back up and get you some cardiac output. Um, iron poisoning, uh, treatment with desferoxamine, um, it 
chelates the iron in the blood and then you excrete it into the urine. All right, so I mentioned with the cyanide something called methemoglobin. Um, that actually is something that can occur during illnesses, specifically gastroenteritis. Also, if, uh, if you have a prominent Mexican-American community, there's something called manzanilla tea, which is chamomile. They give it to their kids when they have colds, and it can cause methemoglobin also. But the way you treat that is actually really cool. It's something called methylene blue. It really is just a blue dye. Um, you inject it into them, and uh, they get better very quickly. You also can give vitamin C. Um, moving on to opioids, so um, your heroin uh, overdoses treatment is naloxone or Narcan. Um, it works very quickly, uh, but it doesn't last very long. I, I'll never forget this guy came in the Parkland ER. He was, you know, pretty much near death, coma, out of it. Gave him some Narcan. He sat bolt upright in bed. It's like. What the hell did y'all do that for? And just collapsed right back in bed. But uh, we had to give him a lot of Narcan. That guy was riding high. Anyway, uh, so just remember, naloxone, Narcan, works great. Doesn't last very long. Um, benzodiazepine, so your Valium, Versed, um, the treatment for that is Flumazenil. Um, it basically just binds it uh, competitively and uh, will reverse your uh, intoxication. Um, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, um, the treatment for that is sodium bicarb. Um, basically, it, they'll say it alkalizes your, your serum, but I think more and more they're finding out that it's really the sodium in it that stabilizes uh, your heart tissue. Tricyclics can give you wide uh, QRS uh, and eventually fatal arrhythmias, um, but uh, sodium bicarb is the initial treatment. You actually treat, they can get seizures too, you treat that with um, um, Versed or Ativan, something like that. Um, let's talk about heparin, an overdose of heparin, anticoagulant. You use protamine sulfate. Um, you just have to memorize that one. Uh, Theophylline, uh, which is a beta agonist, uh, not really used that much anymore, but it's a beta agonist, so to treat it, you would use a beta blocker. Next, I'm going to talk about the designer drugs. They're called designer drugs basically because you take something that you know uh, has a specific effect, tweak the chemical formula, and then uh, produce a new drug. Um, it's useful uh, just because you can't outlaw what you don't know exists, and so um, it's a way kind of to skirt uh, drug laws. Um, first one I'm going to talk about is ecstasy, or MDMA, methylene dioxy, methamphetamine, so it's obviously an amphetamine derivative. Um, Back in the 60s or so, it kind of came out. People started using it for psychiatric counseling and actually kind of were praising it, you know, back in the days when they thought LSD was cool because um, it really let people kind of open up to their feelings. Um, as far as like a, a club or street drug, it actually started in the early 80s uh, in Dallas. They called it Adam at the time um, and then kind of spread nationwide. And then in 1984, it was a... Uh, um, made illegal in the United States. And so um, it had a kind of a quick rise and now is illegal. That, it probably will be a drug that people eventually start using therapeutically again. There's more and more kind of things talking about uh, like people with PTSD or different issues that kind of helps them get through some of that, especially in counseling. Um, how does it work? It causes serotonin uh, release uh, at the synapse. It inhibits the synthesis of serotonin and blocks its reuptake. So basically you get uh, increases of serotonin uh, at the synaptic clip and you decrease the intracellular uh, stores of serotonin. Um, it has a lot of effects. Um, we'll kind of go through them. Uh, cardiac wise, it causes uh, tachycardia, can cause hypertension. You know, the most severe effect but rare is uh, arrhythmia um, there. Um, neurologically, um, it can cause some nystagmus or uh, eye twitching, mydriasis, right? Meiosis is smaller than mydriasis, big pupils. Um, they can have hyperthermia um, and eventually can cause seizures. Um, from a muscle effect, it causes teeth grinding, jaw clenching. Um, if you've ever been to a rave, people walk around with pacifiers, that's why. Drinking a lot of water because they um, uh, can get dehydration from it also.
Um, you can't get hyperglycemia from it also. Um, you got to be careful all those people drinking a ton of uh, water when they're on ecstasy can actually make themselves hyponatremic and have seizures from that. So if they come in um, looking like they've taken ecstasy, you got to kind of make sure you know what you're treating. Um, psych psychologically, it causes euphoria, a lot of empathy. I appreciate here in the book it said uh, social interactivity. Uh, that's an interesting <laughs> euphemism for what people do when they're on X. But anyway, you can get, uh, especially with continued use, a lot of anxiety and hallucinations. Um, the way you treat people that have an XC overdose is um, just kind of chill them out with some diazepam or Valium, and if they're hyperthermic, just kind of keep them cool. A lot of it is just kind of letting some of, the, uh, of it get out of their system. All right, so next drug I'd like to talk about is GHB, or gamma hydroxybutyric acid. It's used in the club scene. It's often used as a date rape drug because it has a very fast onset and it's uh, um, odorless and colorless. You can put it into a drink as a, a powder pretty easily. Um, it, uh, it only takes about 15 minutes to work. It initially causes a lot of euphoria, but then uh, basically causes serious CNS depression. So, you know, they'll start out euphoric, then they go into a deep sleep, um, then you can get coma. Um, the, the bad thing uh, about it from a rape standpoint is it makes you amnestic, and so people don't even remember what happened to them. Um, it does, in smaller doses, decrease sexual inhibition too. Um, the uh, cardiac causes of it, it'll cause a bradycardia. You can get uh, hypotension, a hypoxia. I mean, they're just very depressed. Like, they're very sleepy. Their uh, cardiac output is depressed. Um, when people are coming out of it, they can get real bad hallucinations, agitation, even seizures. Um, one way to kind of differentiate GHB from ecstasy is uh, they'll have salivation. Um, they'll uh, um, be salivating, they're, they vomit, and they'll have hypothermia. So they're cold, ecstasy people are hot. Um, the other thing that it does is it actually decreases how fast you eliminate alcohol. So like, yeah, people take it kind of just like if you take it with alcohol, it kind of heightens uh, both highs. Um, basically the, the treatment uh, for it is oftentimes when people uh, get dropped off, it's like they're just so respiratory depressed, they don't even have a gag reflex, you have to intubate them, let them wake up. Um, you know, you can use Valium or diazepam for that kind of emergence that we talked about, the hallucinations and things like that. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Hello there. Apparently my mind and combat skills are so amazing that headquarters asked me to make this short training video for you all. Today's question is, what is the treatment for methemoglobinemia? First, stop the offending agent if possible. Which, of course it is. Second, administer methylene blue. Preferably in an IV injection. What? This is a dragonberry teeny. Mm. Lesson complete. All right, we're back for quick review number two. Let's get started. How does cyanide adversely affect cells? Well, cyanide inactivates cytochrome oxidase. And when you don't have cytochrome oxidase, you can't go through your normal uh, metabolism. You can't use oxygen the way you should. So you can't uh, exert this uh, uh, respiration metabolism and therefore uh, cells can die and it'll lead to uh, some cyanosis. Next, what is silicosis? Well, silicosis happens when you're exposed to silica. So you inhale a certain amount of silica uh, over a chronic amount of time uh, and then you can get this silicosis. So it's this marked inflammation and you get scarring with nodular lesions and you usually see this in the upper lobes uh, of the lung. And this can lead to a long-term disability, leads uh, also to death and cyanosis, major uh, uh, chronic lung disease. And again, we see this with stone cutters uh, and with uh, people who are sandblasters. They're doing a lot of sandblasting of, of, uh, um, of stone. What does carbon monoxide convert uh, to in the blood? Well, uh, carbon monoxide will bind to hemoglobin and form this uh, carboxyhemoglobin. Now, it has a greater affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. Uh, therefore, you're losing your oxygen-carrying ability in the blood, so it leads to cyanosis. 
Um, now, what do we do to, to fight off carbon monoxide poisoning? Well, we just uh, give someone a whole lot of oxygen. So you use 100% oxygen, and then you tend to be able to uh, uh, revert that back as long as they're coming in with some capability of, of, uh, of recovery. A 22-year-old male presents to the emergency department after having been to a party uh, with CNS depression and respiratory depression. His pupils show uh, meiosis. Now, how would you manage this patient? Um, well, we've been talking about a lot of uh, rare and unusual uh, poisonings uh, here, but still, when, when someone's coming in altered, you kind of have to start at the top. So this, the top thing you need to do is supportive measures. You always want to think about your ABCs. Anyone who comes in with any uh, disability to their CNS or the respiratory function, uh, you want to think about preserving those functions. So it might require intubation, it might require an IV, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, more often than not, when someone comes in altered, you don't necessarily think of cyanide poisoning. Uh, you don't necessarily think of organophosphate po uh, poisoning unless they have a lot of uh, secretions coming on. So the first thing you're going to think about, well, this person's at a party. What's a common thing that could happen to them? Well, uh, they could have an opioid uh, overdose. So another clue to this could be an opioid uh, overdose is that uh, he's got pinpoint pupils. He has meiosis. So what are you going to use to help uh, to counteract an opioid uh, uh, poisoning? Well, you're going to use naloxone or one of the other opioid antagonists. You can now Trexone is another one as well. Um, another possibility is that maybe they have a benzodiazepine uh, overdose as well. So you could use a benzodiazepine antagonist uh, like flumazenil. So usually when patients are coming in, you can't find anything else that's really obviously uh, wrong with them other than this uh, depressed state. Uh, uh, most uh, emergency room physicians, after ma maintaining um, uh, supportive measures, they're going to go to that naloxone or that flumazenil and try to reverse whatever drugs they've been taking. Next. What are the side effects of atropine? Well, we've talked about how atropine is an antidote uh, to organophosphate poisoning, uh, but we also need to know well, what happens if you take too much atropine. Well, atropine is an anticholinergic, so uh, we've learned this. Remember the mad as a hatter, red as a beet, uh, dry as a bone, all those types of, of memory tools. Well, that's what we're talking about here. So you get dry skin, uh, blurry vision, constipation, dry mouth, confusion, dilated pupils. Your skin is really warm. Um, so it's basically the opposite of organophosphate uh, uh, poisoning. So instead of uh, mucus coming out of you, you're drying everything up. Next, what electrolyte abnormality can you get with ecstasy use? Uh, so this is a little bit, uh, uh, not a trick question, but it's not the actual ecstasy that's causing this problem. So. Um, People would go out to raves in the desert, uh, and they would party all night, and they would dance, and they would take their ecstasy, and they would feel fantastic. Um, but they weren't drinking enough, so uh, we would have patients coming to the emergency room terribly uh, uh, dehydrated. So we did a lot of public service announcement stuff, I guess, uh, in education. So we said, hey, we can't stop you guys from taking drugs, but at least drink a lot of water when you're going out to these raves so you're not killing yourselves and dying out in the middle of the desert. So um, the people taking the ecstasy really took this to heart, so they just started pounding the water. I mean, they were just drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. So what happens when you drink way too much water? Well, you can get hyponatremic. So hyponatremia is the answer to the question, and it's really just from excess uh, water intake. What is the worrisome morbidity from uh, acetaminophen toxicity? So uh, unfortunately, uh, people will uh, try to overdose uh, with Tylenol, which is just a terrible way to, to try to kill yourself because it's really a, a slow death if, if you do manage to uh, succeed. Uh, but the main problem is hepatic failure. So you're going to kill off your liver with, uh, uh, with significant amounts of, of acetaminophen toxicity. Next. Which antidepressants should you avoid in patients with suicidal ideation? So we talked about this as being uh, a medication that we have an antidote for, uh, but this is tricyclic antidepressants. There's a, a relatively narrow window of therapeutic index here. Um, it doesn't take uh, too much more above the therapeutic use to get to a lethal dose of, of the TCAs is, is another way of referring to them. So uh, be careful when you're uh, treating your uh, depressed patients, especially if they're very, very depressed or have had uh, suicidal thoughts in the past. You might want to stay away from those tricyclics and, and go for a medication like an SSRI or SNRI, the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, um, before going for the tricyclics. And that's going to conclude our quick review number two. Now's a good time to pause the video and complete the in-session quiz, then restart the video and we'll go through the quiz together. All right, let's finish this up. Let's do our end-of-session quiz. What is the difference between chemicals that exert toxic effects through selective and non-selective actions? 
uh, and give examples of each. Well, for selective actions, chemicals uh, that cause toxic effect can, that can cause a toxic effect by interfering with biochemical pathways or uh, functional molecules. So things that sort of uh, affect you systemically. It gets into the body and then it affects, uh, can affect things in, in multiple areas. So think of warfarin, so it's affecting blood everywhere. Now a non-selective action uh, is where it's basically just local effects at the site of exposure. So think of a, like a strong acid and you get it on your skin, it's affecting just in that one area. You're not necessarily absorbing it and affecting things in other areas. Next, list the possible methods of mercury exposure. Um, so we've got three different ways that we talked about this in the lecture. We have elemental, uh, and that's more uh, of an occupational thing, like uh, inhaling the vapors of, of uh, mercury. We have uh, an inorganic salt, and again, this is occupational exposure, and this is mainly through ingestion. And then we have the organic form, which is probably more common, which you uh, more likely to see, is from fish consumption. Now, you don't see a whole lot of people with mercury poisoning as a result of fish consumption, um, so it's a pretty unusual uh, uh, entity altogether with mercury uh, poisoning. After establishing airway, breathing, and circulation, what is the treatment for a patient that has ingested a large amount of methanol or ethylene glycol? Well, both of those things, it's not, the, it's not them themselves that's causing the problem. It's their toxic metabolites. Um, so you want to inhibit the conversion of the ethylene glycol and the methanol to its toxic metabolite. And uh, the enzyme that does that is the dehydrogenase, uh, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. So in order to inhibit that, you can either flood the system with regular ethanol uh, or alcohol, um, and then that uh, will compete with those two things uh, for that enzyme. Or you can use a uh, fomipazole, which is another form uh, that we try to use. It's a little safer than just giving someone a lot of alcohol um, to help inhibit or at least competitively inhibit uh, that enzyme. What is the antidote to each of the following toxins? So one thing about this lecture is there's just a lot of memorization. You're just going to have to remember uh, the medicine, its toxic effects, and its antidote. And there's just kind of no interesting way of going about it. So we're just going to go through this list. Acetaminophen, you need to remember of uh, uh, N-acetylcysteine. Anticholinergics, think of uh, uh, physostigmine. Benzodiazepine, is a, is, uh, the antidote is flumazenil. Carbon monoxide, it's 100% O2 or oxygen. Cyanide, uh, it's a combination of things. It's nitrite, uh, hydroxocobalamin, and thiosulfate. Digitalis, uh, you can use a digoxin uh, immune, immunoglobulin, uh, FAB, and it, you can also normalize the potassium, which is important. Uh, methanol, ethylene glycol, uh, fomipazole. Heparin, protamine sulfate, lead, dimercaparol, penicillamine, succimer, and uh, calcium EDTA. Mercury, uh, I mean, you can also put in here arsenic and gold, uh, dimercaparol and succimer. Methemoglobinemia, you're going to use methylene blue. Opiates, you can use naloxone, naltrexone, or nalmaphene. Organophosphates, carbamates, or, or nerve gas. Uh, you're going to use atropine, or uh, on top of that, if it's a bad exposure, uh, pralidoxine. Amphetamines, we're going to use ammonium chloride. For beta blockers, you can use glucagon. And uh, for theophylline, you're going to use beta blockers. So you just got to memorize those. There's no easy way around it. Next, what provisions beyond giving atropine uh, also need to be made for organophosphate or nerve gas poisoning? So we've talked about how atropine... Uh, is an anticholinergic. It's blocking the effects of that excess acetylcholine. Um, but we also need to think about respiratory support. So atropine is unable to account for nicotinic overstimulation at the uh, skeletal muscle. So you can have some uh, neuromuscular dysfunction and that can affect your respiratory support. So what are we going to use to help with those nicotinic receptors? Well, pralidoxine. So pralidoxine is a cholinesterase reactivating agent. And it can help with that nicotine receptor as well. Decrease that uh, neuromuscular uh, dysfunction. Name the common effect associated with each of the following toxins. So uh, asbestosis, uh, you can uh, get a resultant mesothelioma. And remember, that can be years and years and years, and even decades into the future that you get your mesothelioma. Benzene, remember, is associated with AML, or acute myelogenous leukemia. Carbon monoxide uh, will you know, ultimately lead in hypoxia and death. And then lead, uh, for long-term sequelae, uh, can uh, lower your IQ. Match the following toxin slash antidote. Uh, pairs with their general mechanism of action. 
Uh, so we're talking about uh, how do the antidotes uh, uh, work in general to, to fight against the toxins. So organophosphates and pralidoxime, you, you're restoring the altered target. For cyanide and sodium uh, thiosulfate, you're providing an alternate target as well. For arsenic and uh, dimercaparol, uh, it's a chelating, so you're binding to uh, the, uh, the, the poison in order to get rid of it. Methanol and flumipazole, you're reducing the metabolic activation. Remember how the alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, we're inhibiting that enzyme so you can't get to that toxic metabolite. Uh, uh, Anticholinesterases and atropine, so you're antagonizing the toxic action. And then acetaminophen and N-acetylcysteine, uh, you're uh, accelerating the detoxification of the, of the toxic agent. Next, describe what is meant by NMDA having a serotonergic effect. So, so NMDA or ecstasy causes uh, serotonin release in general. That's why you feel really good on ecstasy. So you got all this serotonin surging through you. Uh, but unfortunately, it also inhibits its synthesis. Uh, um, so you have a lot of, uh, at least temporarily, a lot of serotonin uh, floating around and you're not able to reuptake it very well. So in the acute response, you feel pretty good. But in the long um, uh, term use of, of ecstasy, you get a serotonin deficit. And there's even been some worry that it's a permanent deficit. So um, you'll notice when people have ecstasy, they feel really good when they're on ecstasy, but uh, you wait a week or so and they feel really bad. Um, they're not happy, they're kind of depressed, and that can go on for quite some time. Now, we don't have any definitive evidence that this can be a permanent state, but we're not so sure. So um, stay away from your ecstasy. It might make you feel good short term, but long term, it might be bad. A patient has hypochromic microcytic anemia and basophilic stippling on a red blood cell smear. Uh, what poisoning does this patient have? Well, if you hear those two things, hypochromic microcytic anemia, basophilic stippling, uh, you, you want to always think of lead poisoning. Which poison produces anticoagulation by inhibiting vitamin K dependent clotting factors uh, 2, 7, uh, 9, and 10? Um, well, that's going to be your uh, rodenticide. So uh, uh, the rodenticides, things that kill off uh, your rodents. And how do we help uh, uh, treat this? Well, you can give vitamin K. So basically, you're inhibiting your vitamin K with the uh, uh, rodenticide. So you can give them vitamin K. If that's not working fast enough, you can give someone fresh frozen plasma, which is basically uh, uh, a normal plasma that has all the clotting factors still in it. So uh, you can use those clotting factors to replenish your, your deficient clotting factors. All right, we've reached the end of the lecture. Uh, that'll be the end of our in-session quiz as well. I uh, hope you learned a little something, and good luck studying.